Hello YouTube, this is Asatsu5 and I'm going to be reviewing a patata knife or a risotza as it's known in its uh, native land. Uh, but I feel that my uh, my interest in knives uh, deserves an intro. Uh, at least the the kind of way I'm I've been the phase I've been in. Uh, all the knives you see before you, excluding this one right here, is connected to a pocket watch. And I, Thought I'd add them in the vi in the shot to make the image more visually appealing or interesting, but all the knives except for this one are from Europe, and three of them are French. One of them is Swiss, and uh, this one, the uh, patata or risotto knife, is from Sardinia. Now. Um, uh, uh, the reason why I've been in the kind of phase that I'm in, the direction I've been going, is because tactical knives are done a lot. These black handle knives, uh, very aggressive look to them. Don't get me wrong, I love them, but uh, especially here in the States, they are done a lot. And frankly, I get kind of bored with them sometimes. I love carrying them. I would, if I had to pick one, a knife to carry with me, it'll be a knife that I could use both utility as a utility knife and as a self-defense knife, dual purposes. But generally if I carry a five and a half inch knife or bigger, I have a traditional knife or a smaller knife to be a companion knife to not freak people out. But if it was just going to be one knife, it'd probably be this one. But I get bored with them because everybody does them. Everybody talks about the tactical knife, the fighting knife. Uh, the self-defense knives, the black knives, whatever you want to call them, everybody talks about these and they get all the press, for the most part. And I feel that um, we're kind of losing touch with our roots. Now, uh, there's a caveat to this. I have a collection of traditional knives and uh, uh, this is a case trapple. This is probably the most common traditional knife carried in the United States. But um, I grow bored of it. Everybody in the South owns a case trapple or case knife in general, and it's not uncommon, uh, especially in Texas or I guess anywhere else in the South or the Heartland. Um, if you see a guy with a cowboy hat, pearl snaps, and Wrangler shoes, I mean Wrangler pants and cowboy boots, it's very common to see them with a leather sheath holding their case trapple. And um, even if they're not wearing all that stuff, it's still really common to see people carrying this knife with the leather sheath that goes on the belt for easy access. My point is, you see this knife a lot. You see it everywhere. Not this particular knife with this handle material and um, aesthetics. This is Dorlin with a jig bone pattern. But you see the case knife everywhere. And you see the case trapple everywhere. You don't see a whole lot of Barlow's, but you see this, the sod buster, and uh, uh, some of the other uh, designs uh, like uh, the t toothpick or the rust lock. You see them all, all over the place. And my opinion is if you review this trapple, you pretty much reviewed every single trapple uh, that Case ever made. There was not a whole lot of uh, diversity in there other than the handle material. Uh, the blades are all the same. You get your California clip, which I don't know why they name it that, and you get your spade blade. Um, they're decent knives. Uh, they're kind of... I've seen some shoddy things come from Case, but in general, if you spend the money on the nicer Case knives, you're going to get a good knife. But they just bore me. They're not that interesting. I'd much rather have a GEC, but um, that's for another video. So I get bored with these because you see them all over the place. Everybody in the States knows about them. Uh, you know, my European audience might want to hear more about GEC or CASE, but my main audience um, is the English-speaking audience, and most of them are in the N North America. I do have some different uh, demographics from Russia and uh, Asia and different other countries, but most of my audience is from the states and I'm making this video for you mostly um, it's anybody can watch it it's just you're my main audience you're who uh, watch most of my videos so um, 
if traditional American knives are out, tactical knives are out, what am I interested in? Well, I'm interested in traditional European blades. Now, uh, this one isn't that traditional, but it is a European blade that is semi-traditional. Uh, it, it's a, a Venturi Knox. Have your pin blade, uh, can opener, bottle opener, screwdrivers, all. This is an awesome knife. I much prefer this to the Case Trapper. And in my opinion, this is the ultimate schoolboy's knife or schoolgirl's knife. You know, every kid that's, you know, of age, uh, and the age can, should be determined by the parent. Um, but uh, this is like awesome school supplies right here. Uh, you know, this is the perfect knife to take to school and use as a tool. It's very non-threatening to the sane people. Um, uh, and it's very useful, it's very utilitarian, non-threatening uh, to people who are halfway knowledgeable about knives. Uh, so this is like, to me, the schoolboy's knife, or schoolgirl's knife, school student's knife, and I love it. But this knife, it gets a lot of press in the United States, and when I say this knife, I mean Venturi Knox. Um, most people in the U.S., if they don't get a, a trap or for their first knife, they get a Swiss Army knife as their first knife, whether it be in Boy Scouts or whatever. This is generally, uh, this or the trap is one of the first knives that uh, parents give their little kids. So, although I love this knife, I don't feel I'm really doing you a service by um, uh, reviewing it. I mean, I'm doing you a service, but you already know about it. Most of you already know about it. I want to show you something that you don't get a lot of, uh, that doesn't get a lot of press, that you might not know about. Now, the next two knives are from France. Well, three knives are from France, but these two knives are very similar. We got an open nail, and we get a um, no tall knife. These knives are very similar. They both have the turning ferrule um, mechanism. They're both made out of a single piece of wood. The big difference is that this is mass produced and this is made by the oldest uh, cutlery company in France by one at Cutler who sees the, the uh, operation from one knife start to beginning. And it's said that they use their own tools, that the company doesn't provide them with tools. So they have an intimate connection with their tools. It's their tools. And I love the blade shape on this one uh, to the open L. This is mass produced. This, not so much. Uh, at least I'm led to believe that. And in my opinion, the Nolto is just a sexy or elegant knife. Uh, it can be dressed up or dressed down. It doesn't make a sound when opening and closing it. So, um, I love this knife. This is one of my favorite traditional French knives. Or it is my favorite traditional French, Fr France, French knife. Can't say it. And I know you want to see the review. So, um, I don't know if I'm going to make this a separate video or uh, add it into the actual review. But I feel that I need uh, an introduction. This is the Laguille knife from France, from the Laguille region. Well, actually, this knife isn't from the Laguille region, it's from the surrounding region. But this knife is named after the region that it was born. It's very interesting because um, this is a very traditional knife from France. It's, in some things, it has stuff in common with this, but it has a whole lot in common with this. This is a cold steel espada. Now, the fact that this is a cold steel espada um, is very different from what the point that I'm going to make, but for all intents and purposes, this is a Spanish Navaja Caraca. It's a modern interpretation of it, but um, and it has some modern features on it, but that's what this knife is trying to represent, is the Navaja Caraca, which is the great-grandfather of tactical knives. Um, the only other tactical uh, folding knife that I can think of that uh, can compete in lineage to this is the uh, Bally Song, which is also a traditional European design. Um, but uh, you got this knife, and you got this knife, and you can see in the handles, and some in the blade shape, that um, um, you have some similarities. And it's also worth noting that the 
case company makes the Texas toothpick or the toothpick model directly related to the Lagule and the uh, Navaja. They all come from the same mold basically. So I wanted to show this knife to you and I did. I reviewed this knife and um, I'm pretty happy with my review and uh, I'm happy I got to share it with you because a lot of you probably never heard of this company, Lagule on Block. And um, you see cheap imitations of these knives in Bud K, but I wanted to show you a higher class knife. This is a knife that you can use and address your situation or casual. Uh, it has Gil George or Firewalk basically. Um, and it's, this is a plain base model um, decoration. They make stuff that is completely put, blows this out of the water. But this is a kind of a base model and it's gorgeous. And um, um, it's cool. The problem with, with this knife and uh, most traditional knives is when I use them, I feel like I'm shaking hands with a cat. And what I mean by that is it's not like uncomfortable in the sense that it's hurting me, but I just don't feel I got a short grip. It feels like I'm using a pinch grip and I'm not and I don't have complete control of the knife when I'm using it. It just it feels like I'm shaking hands with a cat. Um, this one's a little bit different. This one's to me very comfortable to uh, to use. But it's still, it does, it's not as hand filling. Uh, so um, that's when the patata is going to come into play. Now, um, this knife that I'm about to show you is the knife that I had a dream slash nightmare about. If you're a subscriber to my videos, you know that um, I had a dream about the patata knife. And um, I was in Sicily in this dream and I was trying to find the patata knife and I could not find one and finally I bought a knife from someone who said it was a patata and then when I opened the box it was a patata knife and I couldn't get my money back and then when I woke up I realized the patata or the results is from Sardinia and Sis and uh, Sardinia is separate from Sicily they're all not the same island so that's where <laughs> after I had the dream I was like well I gotta get one now so uh, um, I'm about to open the box. For those of you who care about your viewing audience and you want to skip the introduction to um, the review, go ahead and leave it in the comments. I'll probably post it in the description. Um, but I wanted to uh, tell you why I'm being drawn to these knives. And um, this is kind of a base model, but it's beautiful. And um, it's definitely a cool knife. Well, <laughs> oops. Here it is. Sorry, uh, um, I had to do that. This is the original box it came with. There was the certificate of authenticity. It comes with this pocket sleeve, level pouch, but it's not a sheath. And here is the knife. I don't want it to fall. Okay, there it is. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Um, that's the knife. It's relatively massive compared to other traditional knives, traditional European knives. Um, uh, the only other traditional uh, European knife I can think of that dwarfs this is the Spanish Navaja Caraca. And uh, this p specific one is made by um, Vittori, uh, or, yeah, Vittorio, maybe, uh, I'm, I'm extremely dyslexic, uh, Vittori, uh, Mural, uh, Ensons, that's Ensons, um, these are Sardinian names, and I have a hard enough time pronouncing English names and English words, so pronouncing, uh, words in other languages is hit or miss. Sometimes I can pronounce them easier than English words, uh, like Navaja Kraka, I can say that right. In other, in other times like this, I can't get my tongue to move the way I want it to. But there was a certificate of authenticity. Let's talk about the knife. It comes in this beautiful presentation box. You can give it away as a gift. Um, 
this is a base model and it has the mortal uh, blade blade shape mortal leaf blade shape this knife is actually getting a good bit of um, uh, recognition from other companies there's um, two uh, Italian knife, knife companies that sell to uh, the US um, one of them is pretty is a pretty well known Italian company, um, Fox Knives. They were actually producing the uh, patata knife that Spadalco is selling in the Ethnic series. Uh, so Spadalco finally came out with one of these in the Ethnic series. As you know, I'm I'm a fan of the Ethnic series, uh, not always of the ni knives themselves, but I like the fact that they have the Ethnic series. Uh, it's something I'm interested in, but I don't love all their knives. So they came out with this in the Ethnic series with mortar and materials like G10, pocket clips. I think it might be S30V blade steel. No, it's, it, it's N690. I remember it was N690, which is a common uh, European steel. Um, this is stainless steel. This knife is forged, handcrafted, and there's not a whole lot of stainless steels that are forgeable, uh, to my knowledge. I know the 440 series is forgeable. I don't know what else is. So I'm going to assume this is a 440 series. It might be something different. But for the sake of the review, we're just going to call it stainless steel. The handle material is... Uh, uh, ox horn. Now, um, it's worth mentioning that the traditional knives are made out of a ram's horn or sheep's horn called mouflon, if I'm pronouncing that right. And this handle material is beautiful. It has a lot of different colors in it. Um, it's more rustic looking and it's more expensive because uh, this ram's horn is protected. Uh, you can't kill them to make knives. I don't know what the laws are to kill them for food, uh, but it's a it's a, the indigenous uh, sheep around there, uh, and uh, they're very high regarded. They say that domestic sheep came from the mouflon uh, ram, and um, you know so they're protected, but they're still used. So I don't know all the specifics, but I do know that uh, they make cheese uh, from their milk, and I don't know if they kill them for food, but um, when one dies uh, naturally or for uh, harvest, I'm going to say that, they make a knife handle that is in this exact same profile, but it's just a ram's horn. It's not ox horn. Now, to tell you the truth, although I love uh, the... Um, ram's horn version of this because it's traditional is what the average Sardinian would carry back in the day but um, I, I personally like the black handle better because this kind of fits the same role as this knife it's more dressy and when I carry a, um, a, a traditional knife it's for one of two reasons I'm trying to dress up my EDC or um, uh, you know, I'm dressing up the EDC, I'm carrying a tactical knife, and I want something that's elegant, beautiful, um, easy on the eyes to use to in front of people who might be sensitive to knife carry. Now, this one is a pretty massive knife, but it's still very elegant, still, in my opinion, very beautiful, and uh, it's really, really cool. Um, so these knives kind of fulfill the same purpose, but although this one is a little bit more capable in some ways, in some ways it isn't. So um, there you go. These kind of fit the same bill for me. Now, it's worth mentioning this ain't solid black. It has some uh, discoloration right there, some white, as you can see. It adds some visual interest. It's not just a solid block, although the solid block makes it elegant uh, of color. Um, this... Um, allows this white uh, lets you know that it is actually horn and it's not um, a man-made uh, uh, synthetic although they can man-made this image but um, it it just it adds a little bit of visual interest to it you know it just visual interest that's all I can say now it has some walked bolsters which you know add to the visual interest it's pinned 
This is not a back spring. This is a back spacer to give something for the pins to hang on to. You also notice that the handle is contoured, it's rounded. Um, it does have some facets, but it's rounded. Um, and the, it, and uh, so it, it makes it comfortable in that sense. Now the uh, patata knife does have a pretty cool history. It was the knife of the herdsman. It was the everyman's knife. The same way that the uh, Swiss uh, boys are kind of uh, expected and, uh, and, uh, to carry a Swiss Army knife. And it's just, you know, part of the culture. The same way that the um, Laguille knife or the Norto or the Open L uh, is part of the culture in uh, France, although French has many different regional knives. And the Spanish Navaja is to Spain. Um, the regional knives and uh, they uh, have an impact or they have an identity with the region that they represent. Now it's also worth mentioning that um, there are a couple different um, Sardinian knives. Some of them have a kind of a sheep's foot or a blunted tip, you know, like that. Um, for because of a certain time period where pointed blades were not uh, uh, smiled upon, um, they also. Uh, um, I think that I think the website, the Sardinian website that I got this from, also sells uh, high-end stiletto switchblades. But um, it's said that uh, uh, these knives were used by bandits to cut off the ears of the people they kidnapped. To mail off to the family to get ransom. Now I don't know if that's true. That's just something that is a it's, it's an urban legend over there. And I guess if it really happened, it's not a legend. But um, you know, it's it's part of the story of the knife. This knife was used for mainly food prep and also for cutting notches in livestock. I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is still done with pigs here in America. Um, but um, you would use your knife to cut out notches in different locations of the animal's ear. And it was it, do, it did the same thing. It had the same effect of getting a branding iron and branding the livestock. Uh, you, you can tell which animal belonged to who based on the notches in the ear. And to help identify the animal. So, um, this knife was used by the shepherds and the horsemen to food prep and to do some other, uh, you know, utilitarian agricultural tasks. Now, uh, you can also tell uh, that I have kind of a um, preference when it comes to blade shapes. And if I had my. Uh, 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 cold steel um, holdout. It has a very similar blade shape as well. To me, this is like the perfect uh, EDC knife blade shape. Uh, not something I'd recommend for a schoolboy or anything like that because it's fairly aggressive. But it's good for opening up packages. Um, you, you you get great tip control, cleaning your nails. Uh, this blade shape is very very practical. And um, have I told you the name of the people who made this knife? I forgot. I've I've attempted to film this video several times. Uh, I lost my original footage, <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I I was gonna upload this today, uh, or I was gonna upload it yesterday, and then I lost the footage, so I couldn't. Victoria Murilla uh, and Sons. That's in Sons. It was. Uh, the uh, the original guy who started this company or or this business um, um, was Victoria uh, Victoria uh, Mueller, and he, I think he died in the eighties, and his sons took over the operation. But their cutler cutlery heritage goes back to the eighteen hundreds or the nineteenth century, and this is a certificate of authenticity, both in Sardinian or Italian. I don't know. The languages are actually all different in English. Um, now, what is this knife going to cost you? Well, this, remember, is kind of the base model. You get uh, ox horn, you get stainless steel. It's forged, it's handcrafted, but it's the base model, and it's going to cost you around $180. And um, 
these are small batch knives. They make, I, I hear they can make one knife a day. Like if they started a knife, which they do start to finish, it takes them one day to make one knife. That's them booking it uh, and not messing around. So it's not like they're mass producing these things. You can find uh, cheap imitations made in Italy. Or not all of them are cheap, but they're not made in Sardinia. Um, and some of them are cheap, and some of them, like the Fox Knives or the Extreme Rio, uh, who make more tactical like one versions of this, um, you know, they're cool, but they're not traditional and they're not made in the old way. Now, what did I use this knife for? Um, before I get into that, I wanted to show you the sheath, or it's not a sheath, it's a pouch. Um, it has the name of the cutlers uh, on it. Um, goes in like so. It is not a sheath. It's very finely stitched. Uh, very well finished. It's very plain. I, this is how I carry this knife. Uh, if it didn't come with it, I wouldn't carry it in a level sheath. But it came with it. I was like, well, I might as well enjoy the pouch. So I'll carry it. It does make deploying it uh, a little bit more cumbersome, but it also protects uh, this knife from things in my pocket, and it protects my things in my pocket from this knife. So it does serve a purpose, but I wanted to mention that. Uh, it's not a sheath. Uh, uh, it's just a pouch that you can put in your pocket. So uh, what did I use this knife for? Um, keep in mind this is not a locking blade, but it does retain with friction. This this style of knife is often called a penny knife. It's but it's a friction folder in the truest sense that your grip does not hold the knife open like a um, standard friction folder would. This is only fitting into there. There's no ex extended tang, so this is a friction folder in its truest sense, and it's not going to come out. Um, uh, when you're shaking it in everyday use, and either way, but um, I almost cut myself there, but it will uh, kind of, it has kind of a weak spot. But the important thing is, won't uh, drop out this way, won't drop out that way. So I'll, I'm willing to live with that. But what I use this knife for, as with most of my traditional knives, keep in mind I use my traditional knives for mainly two reasons opening up packages and mail third reason cutting some kind of cordage or food prep the only knife that I really don't use uh, a traditional knife that I don't use for food prep is the Swiss Army knife this is my office knife so to speak uh, I'd also use it you know whenever but for some reason I never use that one for food prep I've used the case trap or I've used uh, the not uh, well, not the Nortel because it has a wooden handle and wood swells when gets when it gets wet. Or oh, this type of handle swells when it gets wet because it, it is the handle and it's um, pressing up against the tang of the knife. This one I use for food prep and it's in contact with metal, not the wood. The wood is a handle scale, so moisture doesn't affect this as much. But this knife... This is like the ultimate traditional food prep knife. And I'll give you some reasons. Um, you get the point, which is good for opening up packages of food, depending on um, what you're eating, if it's in a shrink wrap or whatever. You get a relatively long uh, blade for a traditional knife. It's over four inches. I think I have the measurements with me from the last time um, uh, I... Um, um, film this video. Let's see if I do. Um, 4.7244. Uh, so um, it's almost 5 inches, but it's 4.7 basically. And um, that's a lot of blade for a traditional knife. That's not a novelty uh, oversized trapple, uh, which I've owned in the past. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but um, this gives you a long cutting uh, edge so you can do you know kind of these uh, dragging cuts on the cutting board um, you can it's um, it's good enough you can cut 
vegetables or herbs or anything like that. I also find this is just big enough to cut up Spam into little Spam steaks to, uh, to cook and then eat as a sandwich or whatever. Uh, I do eat Spam uh, sometimes when camping or a lot of times when I'm camping and uh, sometimes if I have nothing else better to eat. Spam isn't my favorite but it gets the job done and it's not bad. <laughs> uh, and it's it's not made out of organs, so to speak. It's made out of shodel meat. Uh, but uh, this knife, but just barely spans the um, uh, spam, spans the spam, and you can get a, a good cut and slice it up relatively easy. Sometimes I'd have to make a second cut because it was just like that much connected. But in general, you can cut up spam with this, which is. Uh, a relatively big thing to cut. You're not going to do it with this knife. You're not going to do it with this knife. Uh, you're not going to do it with your average slip joint or traditional knife. This knife is big enough it can handle that. It's big enough where you can cut up uh, a steak. Um, which I'm going to get into some uh, key factors you need to take into consideration when using this as a food prep knife. Whether it's cutting up cooked food or uncooked food. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed using this knife in the kitchen. And if you're the kind of guy who likes to have their personal steak knife, carry it with you, um, you can use this. Now, it's, it should be stated that if you use any of your personal knives as a personal steak knife in a restaurant, you're going to be rubbing the blade on a ceramic plate. And for those of you who are not knife savvy, that's gonna um, uh, take the edge completely off your knife. So in general, if I'm gonna use a knife as a steak knife and it's gonna be my own personal knife, um, I'll use a case. Um, I've used other traditional knives, but I don't use my very nice ones. Well, I have used some nice ones, but I don't use my favorite ones on ceramic plates. Don't use a ceramic cutting board. Never, never buy a ceramic or glass cutting board because that is just stupid uh, by wood or plastic and uh, so keep that in mind uh, uh, you can use it in the restaurant setting but I find prepping uncooked food uh, vegetables, herbs, meats uh, on a cutting board this is very good at if you want to use it to cut up your steak or whatever meat you're eating uh, in a plate type section, uh, in a cooked state, use it in a picnic setting. Uh, I use um, my uh, 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 traditional pocket knives when I'm eating on a paper plate, uh, uh, not so much styrofoam if I can help it because that can turn bad really quickly. But yes, if I'm eating on a pe paper plate, I'll use this type of knife and it works great. Um, so the picnic setting, the, the pre-served setting where you're actually preparing the meal, this knife is, works very well and uh, it, it also does other tasks. It's sizable enough that you can run the blade across something and have a long cutting distance. You get a good tip, you can clean your fingernails with it if you do that kind of thing. Um, which I have nothing against. Sometimes that's the only thing I have. I don't own uh, nail clippers or anything like that. I use like this quite a bit. Um, but yeah, $180 gets you a knife that is uh, very emblematical of a region in Europe. It is the second biggest island in uh, the Mediterranean right after Sicily. And I love those types of knives. I love knives with a cultural and historical significance. You, you can, you know, I'm a big fan of the Navaja Caraca. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Nortel and the uh, Laguille and the Sack of Swiss Army knife um, because th they represent a region of a geographical region uh, on the map, and it it says a lot about the people who use them and who and where they're from. So, they make these in different sizes. This is a um, 12 centimeter blade. Uh, they have 10 centimeter blades. And I've seen some uh, 
uh, not on the website where I bought this, but uh, I've seen some that were considerably bigger than this. And I don't think I'll get one that's bigger than this um, unless you're going to use it as a dedicated kitchen knife. But it would be a little bit more difficult to pocket. Uh, this knife takes up a lot of room in the pocket, especially with this. It's not like uh, impossible to carry. It's, it's easy to carry, but you definitely can't fit this, a tactical knife, and something else in there. Uh, but yeah, uh, I really enjoy this knife. This one's going to stay in my collection. I'm probably going to sell this one and eventually get a Fontenay Patu, which is like the uh, Rolex version of this. Uh, or maybe not Rolex, but, you know, BMW maybe. Uh, uh, it's not custom, but it's close to it. And I wanted, the whole point of this video, other than showing you the patata knife or the results, uh, is to share with you the European blade culture. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is my first French knife. It's also my first custom knife. It was my first knife that I spent over $100 on, or actually over $500 on. This is made by a French knife maker that I consider a friend. I don't talk to him very much, not like I used to, but uh, if I ever go to France, I'm going to look him up, Bastinelli from Bastinelli Creations. Um, you know, I want to share with you the European blade culture, because that's where we inherit all blade culture. Uh, the Native Americans really didn't have a metallic blade culture. There was a small area that had copper blades, but for whatever reason, that never caught on. So, um, but yeah, it's part, it's not only a part of the European heritage, it's kind of a part of the American heritage. Like I said, the Navaja Caraca both influenced the French design legule and the case toothpick. So, it's very much still a part of our heritage. Um, and I wanted to share that with you. And that's the main point of this video, not only to show you the knife, but to share a, um, a realization of they got good stuff over there. Or the Japanese, the, the Asian knives that are made overseas also get a lot of um, um, air time. But over here, we just don't hear about these knives that much. And um, so I wanted to share it with you. And I know I'm repeating myself because I so enjoyed these knives. So that's it. I hope y'all have a great day. I'm a Satsu 5, and I'm out.